College Algebra, Chapter 3, Section 1, Functions. First objective, objective 1. Relation or function? Okay, let's do a definition here. A relation is a rule that assigns to each element of the domain usually call that x comma at least at least one element from the range usually that's y so this is what a relation is so almost anything can be a relation, just so there's some rule that's, you know, if I choose this, then I have at least this choice. Maybe there are several choices for that one X value, a bunch of Y values. But there's at least one from the, dom the range for the domain. So what is a function? Well... A function is a relation. So every function is a relation, but not every relation is a function. Because now we change things. I'm going to use these uh, ditto marks. That assigns, that's from up here, to each element of the domain x comma, instead of at least one, we're going to say exactly one. Element from the range y. So, the big difference not every relation is a function, but every relation is some sort of rule. And every function is a relation instead, but in, for a relation, at least one. This is exactly one, only one, if you want to write that. No more than one. Now, that doesn't mean that these that are assigned from the range can't be assigned to more than one x, but every x has exactly one y. That is the definition of a function. Now you can write these a bunch of different ways. One way to write a function is that a is as a set of ordered pairs. So this is a set, and these are ordered pairs. Here's one, two. Uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and we'll write another one here, 7, 9, and then close it. This is roster notation. This is the set of ordered pairs. The x value, 1, 3, 5, 7, 7, is the domain. One, three, five, seven, but you don't write it twice. And the range are the y values. The two, four, six, eight, nine. Now the question is, this is a relation. Anything's a relation. The, re the rule setup is really with the ordered pairs. 1 gets assigned 2, 3 gets assigned 4, 5 gets assigned 6. And we just did that with this direct relationship 
um, with ordered pairs. Is every element in the domain assigned exactly one element in the range? Well, does one get any more values besides two? No, it would be listed here somehow. How about three? No, it just gets that four. Five only gets six, but seven is assigned both eight and nine. So is this a function? No, because seven is assigned more than one. Remember, relation is at least one, but now seven has got two, so that can't be a function. So this is just a relation. If we would take that same set, one, two, three, four, five, six, and stop, I guess, with seven, eight. Then we could say, is that a function? And this is a function. The domain is still one, three, five, seven. The range is two, four, six, eight. We don't have that duplication. Seven is not assigned twice up here. So, how do you figure out if this is a function? I'm going to put function here. How do you figure out if a set of ordered pairs is a function? You look at the x coordinate. If it's used more, more than once, then it is not a function, it's a relation. If the x-coordinate is used just once each time here, then it is a function. Okay, we can draw a picture, or let's do a table first, but a table is sort of like an ordered set of ordered pairs. Because you're going to list the x and the y values. Here's 1, 3, 5, 7, and this is the 2, 4, 6, 8. So it's really like a set of ordered pairs. This is a function. Once again, what do you look at? You look at the x. Is it used more than once? Every element? If it is not, it's a function. But there's also these uh, sort of pictures. So if this is the domain, and it has 1, 3, 5, and 7, and this blob is the range, it has 2, 4, 6, and 8, then you can connect 1s to 2, 3s to 4, 5s to 6, 7s to 8. And you can see that for every element of the domain, there's exactly one element in the range. And this must be a function. But as soon as we add that 9 and say, you know what, 7 is also assigned to 9, then you can see that this has two assignments to it. And it is no longer a function, it is a relation. Now, functions, um, we want to get this notation down, too. Uh, usually, we use f for function of x. This is one chunk of notation. This is exactly the same as y. It's read f of x. But that's one thing. It's not f times x. It's f of x, function notation. There is no relation notation, just function notation. Okay, um, objective two. So for objective two, they want find the value of a function. Well, what do they mean by that? We're going to write this in function notation. f of x is, say, 3x squared plus 2x. So we're saying this is a function. Remember, this is exactly the same as y. We're just, it's just like y equals, but we're writing it as f of x. 
This notation is sort of nice, this f of x function notation, because you can say, what is f of 1? And that tells us what we're supplying for x. It'd be 3 times 1 squared plus 2 times 1, which would give us 3 times 1 plus 2 or 5. This would be the ordered pair. Remember, what's inside these parentheses is x, so it's 1, 5. What is f of negative 2? Once again, that's what you put in for x. 3 times a negative 2 squared plus 2 times a negative 2. Let's see, we need, um, this is positive 4 times 3. So that's 12. And 2 times negative 2 is a negative 4, which is 8. So this gives us the ordered pair negative 2, 8. Also, we call x part of the domain, but it is the independent variable. And y, I guess it should be the dependent variable. We call this x for this function notation. You'll hear me use the term. This is called the argument of f. Whatever's in the parentheses for the function notation. The argument. Okay. Objective 3. Find the domain of functions. We're going to worry about range later on. The domain is usually easier to determine. It's not always easy to find, I guess, directly what's in the domain. Sometimes it's easier to find what to exclude because usually that makes it, uh, there's fewer things to exclude. And you can say, give me everything that's left over. So, and we usually start with the real numbers. And then find what to exclude. The two things in the real numbers that cause problems, always division by zero. Not just the real numbers, anything. We haven't def figured out how to... Divide by zero and get something that works. So never, ever, no matter what set of numbers you're talking about, do you divide by zero. But in the real numbers, we also have the square root of a negative. And I might also add, this could be any even root, the fourth root, sixth root. But in general, it's the square root of a negative. So when you throw out what those are, you want to exclude... Division by zero, x's, and or real numbers, and square roots of negative real numbers. <coughs> so, if um, you have a function, and it's defined with a square root, then you start worrying about that second situation. We'll say it's 1 minus x underneath there. So, we would like the domain to be everything except for where this is negative. So 1 minus x has got to be greater than or equal to 0. A negative x has then got to be greater than or equal to a negative 1 if we subtract 1 from both sides. When you multiply by a negative, what do you do to the inequality sign? You change the direction. So x is less than or equal to 1. So the domain is the set of all x such that x is less than or equal to 1. In interval notation, we want to go to a negative infinity and start out at 1. I'm sorry, I got to end at 1. You always go left to right. That's why this is a little confusing, perhaps. And on the number line, here is 1. I guess we can put 0 in here if we want. 
but it's a solid dot at one and then everything to the left with an arrow. So that's the domain. Up here, let's look at um, the function. Oh, we can use different letters. Let's use G. G of X is uh, 1 over X plus 2. Well, there's no division or no squares and negatives involved here, but there could be a division by 0. We want to make sure that X plus 2 is not equal to 0. So X cannot be a negative 2. And that's what helps. This is why set builder notation is so nice. The domain is the set of all x such that x is not equal to 2. Now, how do you do that for interval notation? You start out at a negative infinity. You come up to a negative 2. Skip it. Then you start just after it. Union, negative 2, but don't include it. And go up to infinity. So in this case, it's a little easier to write it in set builder notation. And of course, the number line with just an open circle on negative 2 would be how you'd graph it. Okay. Last objective, objective 4. These are called... It's called the algebra of functions. And this really is uh, making sure you can see. And because it, it's so common sense, you're going to say, why do you have to say this? You have to say this so everybody knows that you can use this. If you take two functions and add them together, f and g, and then evaluate them at x. The argument is x. Well, how might you do that a different way and get the same answer? You evaluate these individually at x, and then add those answers together. This works. You say, doesn't it always work? Not always. For functions, it works, but it's not doesn't work for every relation and things like that. Um, I'm not sure I can think of an example where it doesn't work, though. But you've got to say this. For mathematics, they want everything sort of written down. If you have f minus g at x, what do you suppose this becomes? Well, evaluate them first and then subtract. So whatever is more convenient. Combine the two functions and then evaluate or evaluate and then combine their answers. The same thing works with multiplication. f times g of x is f of x times g of x. You can multiply before or after. And the divide, f over g of x is f of x over g of x. But now we got to worry about that division by 0. g of x cannot equal 0. So, um, this is the algebra of functions. I guess at this point we're not going to talk about the composition. That must be later because that's not in my notes. On page 215, there is a summary about important facts that's in the blue box. About functions. On page 219, There's a summary of all this, of functions. These are both the blue boxes. And I think 
you should be able to do all of these problems without any problems. Um, there is one, I guess, on page 221 that we might want to go through. Let's look at problem number 80. They give us something called the difference quotient. It is f of x plus h minus f of x over h. This is used in differential calculus, and the reason it's used uh, is that's how they define the derivative. They'll say the derivative with y with respect to x is the limit as h goes to 0 of this f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So they want you to get familiar with how to work that difference quotient problems. And see, I've got two steps already. But they're going to say, okay, okay, let's let f of x equal... 1 over x plus 3. The directions. Find the different quotient. For each function, be sure to simplify. So, our difference quotient. What is f of x plus h? We need that first. f of x plus h. We've got f of x. How do you write f of x plus h? And maybe this is where I want to make sure there's no big problems. Whatever's in parentheses goes in for the x. It's 1 over, instead of just x, it's x plus h plus 3. So this x plus h is what replaces the x. Sometimes it's better to think of this as f of something, say a box that can hold anything, and it's 1 over box plus 3. So whatever you put in that box, you put in this box. You put an x plus h. So, our difference quotient is the 1 over x plus h plus 3 minus 1 over x plus 3 over h. Now, it says it wants us to simplify this. Well, remember, this is division by h, so you can say this is really 1 over h times this stuff. So, let's go down over here, and this will be 1 over h times this, all this stuff, x plus h plus 3, 1 over x plus 3, and that won't be this complex fraction then. Remember, h cannot be 0. So then this becomes, I'm going to put that down here. In order to combine fractions, we need a common denominator. The common denominator is x plus 3 times x plus h plus 3. So this left fraction needs an x plus 3, and the right fraction needs an x plus h plus 3. So let's leave the 1 over h here. And now, x plus 3 over x plus 3 times that one is an x plus 3 in the numerator, and our common denominator x plus h plus 3 and x plus 3. Minus, this needed the x plus h plus 3 over that common denominator x plus h plus 3 times x plus 3 equals... Now we can combine these two. So I have the 1 over h outside still. And it's over this common denominator, x plus h plus 3 times x plus 3. But the numerator, you've got to be a little careful. It's x plus 3, but it's subtracting all this. It's subtracting the x, so x minus x, that cancels. It's subtracting the 3, 3 minus 3, that cancels. And there's only an h left in the numerator. Okay, now I left that 1 over h outside, so to speak. So this h cancels that h. And this is where, in mathematics, you can make a lot of really good jokes. We got the h out of there. <laughs> anyway, 
that is 1 over, and I would just leave this, don't multiply it out, x plus h plus 3 times x plus 3. Forgot my parenthesis here. That is your final answer reduced. So I didn't need all this extra stuff up here, but that's what they want. And that's why they ask it. You might say, where did they come up with this? This is the definition of the derivative of y at some value x, some variable x. Okay, so now you should be able to do all these. Let's hope. If you have questions, let me know. We'll see you in the next section.